So, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm quite humbled to be here amongst all the experts in transformative experience design. And it's also great to be here in this uh, lovely place. It's quite an amazing campus. So, what I'd like to talk to you today is a bit about our own attempts to really design for positive transformative experiences using mostly the virtual mixed reality. So I'll talk a bit about uh, research we did, but then also about our recent attempts to bring this actually to the classroom where we can try and reach a lot larger audience. But before I start, I'd really like to thank all my wonderful collaborators, Alex and Katarina, also here. Without them, none, none of that would be possible. So uh, uh, we're at Simon Fraser University uh, in the west uh, end of Canada, near Vancouver, where I lead the ice space lab. All right, so um, probably Andrea already talked all about this, but I didn't quite understand every single word because my time is very good. Me neither. What are these positive transformative experiences? I mean, can you imagine an experience that really goes deep enough that it's positively life-changing? How would these look like? What would these be? And it turns out when the astronauts came back from space, a lot of them really did have these deep, profound changes in their worldview. Suddenly, by first being separated and then seeing and reconnecting to Earth, they felt a deeper appreciation and connection to the space. Uh, this was, as I think you mentioned, uh, is called the overview effect. And uh, I can mention nicely summarized it. We went to the moon as technicians. We returned as humanitarians. We develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics look so petty. Isn't that the kind of experience we wish more people would have? Especially nowadays, uh, that there's an increasing amount of hate and anger and separatism going on, both in Europe and the rest of the world. So imagine we could use media, transformative media, to give people give more people access to such experiences without having to shoot more people out into the moon without the incredible carbon footprint cost and also risk associated with this. So what if we could use uh, tools such as virtual reality and other technologies to really bring those experiences into our lives so we can better understand them, really design to them for them, learn how to do them and thus make them accessible for the larger audiences. So, just a bit of background, I think uh, Andrea went into this and one of the later talks will go more to this. So what we mean by positive transformative experiences is not traumatic events, we mean positive experiences that have a lasting positive effect uh, that can really change the person. And often these are not in the year gradually events, there's often a shift, a disruption, it's discontinuous, can be non-linear, can be pivotal, can be self-transcendent experiences where you can uh, drop the ego, can be peak experiences. A lot of them are related to nature, so seeing the earth from space, but also near-death experiences, or things like uh, achieving something uh, profound, like reaching Antarctica. Importantly, we cannot design the experience. The experience really happens in the person and the user. So we can only try, try to create an environment of forms and that the person really needs to actively co-create the experience. So why do we care about these? So why, 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 why might we want to care about such experiences? As um, Andrea and others pointed out, they really support our natural tendency towards self-actualization and self-transcendence. And also because they can provide deep shifts, they really give us unique opportunities for personal development and epistemic expansion. Pragmatically, they actually are related to a lot of positive benefits, like improvements in well-being, um, pro-sociality, improvements uh, in uh, our caring for others, humanity, environment, and even feeling of connectedness and oneness. So, if you think about your own experiences, what are the key experiences you had yourself that really transformed you? How did they happen? Were they planned? And are the experiences you wish you could somehow let others share, that uh, you could give others access to these experiences? What helps 
often is that these experiences are very specific, elusive, they are rare, so they are really challenging to elicit, and that also experimentally makes it quite hard to do in the research. A lot of the experiences are also private, so it's really hard to observe them without interfering. Often we only know afterwards, so after the event, from people's introspection, from their recall, from their telling of stories, but it's really hard to observe them in action. It actually turns out when you teach, and sometimes these moments happen, then you actually can witness them, which can be quite amazing. These experiences can also be quite personal, so context dependent, it's very unpredictable, which means they're also really hard to generalize. And in essence, they're kind of a hard thing to study, and so, which also means there isn't that much research going on here yet, but it's, it's now nicely improving, which is great. So, one of the questions we ask in our research, like many others, could we use tools such as virtual reality to help elicit and really study these transformative experiences? Or, more generally, can virtual experiences actually have a real effect and really be transformative? So, first of all, what is virtual reality really? Many of you have probably tried it out. Here's just a simple example where I just kind of navigate through a virtual Vancouver simply by leaning in the direction I want to travel. So we really want to get rid of interfaces so I this feeling of directly being in a bit of non mediation. And then I was also giving people an experience that you couldn't otherwise have, like flying through the city. Else, why would you use technology if you could just do it in reality? So, why are we talking about virtual reality here? Well, sometimes it has been called the ultimate media. Not that it's said that the greatest, but in a way, because theoretically you can simulate all other experiences in virtual reality. So you can talk to people, you can play games, you can read a book, you can watch a movie, you can interact with people in virtual reality, but not the other way around. Pragmatically, it's quite convenient because you have high control, replicability, experimental control, stimulus control, which is useful. It is, interestingly enough, if, especially if you use a head-mounted display, you can have private experiences in the lab, which is actually really important for transformative experiences and research. So you can provide first-person embodied experiences, so literally you can try and experience what somebody would see, hear, and feel, but you can also present a third-person viewpoint or be completely disembodied and anything in between. So there's quite some flexibility. You can immerse uh, people provide them spatial presence, so we place the illusion of really being there, but also plausibility illusion of, oh, this might actually be possible, this might be happening. And because you can have a very degree of interactivity and control, it can also help to give people agency, which really helps to engage people more. <coughs> so, of course, you can simulate existing things, but it also gives you the opportunity to simulate things that are not possible in reality. So when you can mess with time and space, with identity, and all kinds of other things you can think of, which of course affords a lot of things to do with the real world experiments. Now you might wonder, well this all sounds really good, but can virtual experiences really have an effect? So here's a few examples. So we suggest show that just modeling avatar of a different race, a different color, this can really help to reduce bias. Or if you fly like a superhero in virtual reality afterwards, that actually enhances pro-social behavior, as if people kind of get the idea of being the superhero. We have people try to virtual exposure treatment to really reduce anxiety disorders. <coughs> people in a virtual snow world, this can actually help to reduce acute pain uh, in birth patients. Or if you become the animal in virtual reality, this can uh, improve your connection to nature. And we know that virtual reality can also induce awe and uh, uh, increase or produce goosebumps. So basically, one of the physiological indicators that you really have an inspiring moment. Let me give you an example of one of these experiments that we read here. Thank you. 
preface with the introspection afterwards. To be honest, I probably had two different ways of sitting, so I'm just kind of standing like I do now, or just more like flight on the chairs. So, I think Alicia will talk a lot more about the bottom end, but just in essence, it's one of these emotions that has been linked a lot to qualitative shifts or quantum uh, psychological change. This can just be a simple aha moment. The realization might be also much more, uh, be much more deep, like a mystical transformation or even epiphanies. And often it combines some kind of perceptual or conceptual vastness with the need to do something about it, the need to economically accommodate, to really shift change to the next level. So, how do we design for these experiences? I mean, that's kind of a million dollar question. And, um, so here, because there's a lot of other talks, I'll just give a brief overview of a simplified framework. So, in essence, if you have an experience that doesn't quite fit your worldview, you have two options. You can kind of ignore it, go back. Or, if there's enough you know, perceptual dissonance, you might want to somehow integrate it or accommodate it. So you change your worldview or your appreciation for the group for the planet, for example, yeah. That happened for the astronauts. So there can be a cognitive shift. Now, but what happens once you shift your thinking, this might not match your behavior anymore. So, for example, you might feel more connected to nature, but you still fly five times across the Atlantic for a year in car footprint is ridiculous. So you have this uh, cognitive dissonance between what you think and what you do. So, again, you have two options. You can kind of go back and just kind of ignore it, or you can really try, try and change your behavior. So what we're trying to do for some of the experiences we designed in virtual reality and also in the classroom is trying to use frameworks like that and some of the other ones to really design specifically for these kind of dissonances, conflicts, where things seem to happen. Here's another example called the awe-inspired wellness environment. So it makes a nice acronym of awe. The awe-inspired wellness environment. The experience begins with the immersive to enter a pre-VR physical mixed reality environment that helps them become relaxed and open to the experience ahead. After approximately 10 minutes in pre-VR, the immersive sits in a hands-free interface called the Olympic Chair. This interface allows for intuitive navigation in our virtual environment. The immersive wears a VR headset and noise cancelling for full immersion. The next stage finds the immersive in a camping site in the forest. This stage encourages the immersive to freely explore and interact with a playful sprite creature who acts as their companion and guide. Because the lower body drives this interface, they don't have to worry about buttons on hand controller that can distract from their immersive experience. Instead, they simply lead in the direction that they wish to go. Entering the lake requires a leap of faith. The water environment is calming with creatures present that incite curiosity. A portal into space emerges, and the immersive is guided by the sprite through the nebulas to an epic view of a planet in a ground climax. They return back to the campsite where it is now daytime, and the virtual experience ends. To address usability concerns around navigation, we built upon early prototypes that used a lean paradigm of positional tracking, as seen here. For evaluation, we replayed a recording of the immersive experience to identify the moment-to-moment -moment UX and emotional features of our system. We help re-immerse them in the experience again, and then we conduct in-depth explorations of the moments of interest. Biosensors also tell us a lot about their experience. We record the presence of chills and goosebumps on the skin, which is an indication of awe, and we record respiration rates. In this next prototype, respiration, the act of breathing in and out, can control the movement of jellyfish in the lake. Immersives might enjoy the playful interaction and the introspective awareness that this allows. So in a way, this is both a kind of an artistic installation and a research prototype, a living lab that we keep improving on. So 
So for example, last summer we actually added a longer pre and post experience to gradually bring people in and create ceremonies and rituals uh, to really get them from the current state from the here and now in the real world to the virtual world. Other experiences we tried, just an older one, the Sonic Cradle, uh, were the idea that you have complete darkness and with breathing sensors you control sound, you summon a sound scale that's being shaped depending on how you breathe, how deeply you breathe. So it's really a playful exploration like you hear in the background. But instead of normal meditation where you kind of need to consciously always be aware and stay in the moment, here when you kind of lose focus, you hear it. Students 
in the classroom and it's totally unpredictable. So here's, I'd just like to give you one example of what we uh, try to do. So here, that was at the beginning of the course where we really wanted to create both a team building activity, that's how we phrase it to them, it's like a fun team building activity, um, where we basically ask them to, okay, you're in a team and everybody has to touch the ball uh, eight times, do that as quickly as possible. What they did not know is that we would change the instructions over time. And so our idea is really to try and help them to get unstuck the first and second solutions and ideas and really think deeper by giving them challenges. So initially we thought, oh, yeah, sure, that's fine, we can do that. Uh, now we told them, okay, do the same thing, five seconds, go. That was really interesting to see. So they tried to optimize and make things faster initially. And, but you can only go so far with that. So at some point they realized, well, we can't quite make the five second mark there. So we really can't achieve this using the old strategies. So then things started really shifting. And uh, people came up with new solutions. Went, oh, okay, here's an interesting one. Or again, people touch it. And that got close to the five second mark. And for sure people did have fun doing that. Um, but then they started becoming really creative, and that's really what you wanted. Do you tell them that? This is the kind of thing that you can just if you like it. And so for sure they enjoyed this. And then came the next challenge. Okay, I'll try to do it in one, one second. How would you do that? And that's really where we could see, okay, are the students ready to sit around? So, and indeed we have a lot of uh, people saying like, oh, there must be a way. So they kind of trusted us that we wouldn't give them an exercise that's not possible, so that's good. Uh, but it was only one thing like, oh, we can't do this, let's get started. So here's uh, the final version. And they used three years. So they literally managed to do this with under sand. And uh, later on we told them why they did this, but not uh, beforehand. And it was really interesting to see how they realized, like, oh, I guess I have to radically try something completely different. Incremental improvements sometimes don't cut it. Sometimes you need to go deeper. Now, of course, we're wondering, okay, all seems so good, but did they really shift? So is there any evidence that their mindset really shifted over time? And of course, we don't have a randomized controlled environment in the classroom. It's, it's kind of messy. So what we do have, however, are some anecdotes uh, and some examples. So one that was totally not planned. So two months later, to the final showcase, as you see, it was quite an elaborate setup that they built and constructed. And one thing they constructed was these large, huge wooden frames, basically. Uh, and at the end, it was a big cubus, and it completely collapsed while people are standing there. So uh, security came running, nobody was hurt, so that was good. Uh, they were, uh, the guy constructed what was really devastated for a moment. But they didn't take a long time, just within just a few seconds, they were like, okay, let's shift, let's do something else. So here's what one of the students wrote in the final reflection. A big critical moment for me was during the final showcase, where a wooden structure we had been uh, building collapsed. Without hesitation, we quickly pivoted and started the platform the what next moment. This was critical because it began to connect the dots with improvisation, the art of not being too attached. It was interesting to see how quickly we pivoted and cleaned up and redirected our energy elsewhere. In fact, I'd say that the moment alone caused me to reevaluate how I viewed the class as a community. So some of these moments happen, you cannot plan for them, you can just see the moment and maybe help people reflect a little bit on what is really going on. And here's another experience that we kind of hope would have, but you never know. So I'll let the students speak themselves. Hope you can hear this. So how did that happen? Why? No. Made them realize, oh, okay, I got there's something about the agile methodology that really, that really 
his hands. So what else did you put? So at the end of the class, I mean, we did a lot of reflection sometimes on a daily basis and one major one at the end. So you just the themes um, that came up during the final reflections. One is really gaining a sense of agency. Here's a quote from one of the students. I always loved to complain about how disengaging courses were, but never really did anything to change my mindset in order to be more engaged myself. This is also that something that we observed uh, quite a bit uh, from the students. So they become better and better at really making propositions, asking, arguing what they wanted and what they needed. Another one was transformation in self-concept and self-awareness. This course transformed my understanding of self, facilitated a better learning, and helped to navigate my life. What I couldn't expect at the time was how much this course transformed me into a better person in many aspects. So, of course, we didn't expect our course to really help them become a better person. I mean, you always wish, but it was beautiful to see this and really moving. Often it was really the challenges and failures that really created this with our largest impact. Here's one. First, we're stuck I one of the Sims Teacher Project and how it was a beautiful fail. We call it a beautiful fail because it was beautiful and made that they didn't really repeat the experience that they had aimed for. It shifted my case entirely in terms of trying to get to the core experience done. I was always aiming at top level kind of project, 100% polished, and I had been so persistent in it that I didn't really know the elusive nature of goal, purpose, and meaning as if I was blind. The most prominent theme was really developing a sense of community, switching from a self-centeredness to a collective mindset. So I usually get a few quotes from the students. What made this experience so incredible to me was how much it felt like a community, almost like I was a second home and we had another family. I was surprised to see how from the more individualistic person I transformed into a team-based person. That was my biggest change, my biggest understanding, my biggest fear before coming to class. I came to class being afraid what I won't be able to, that I won't be able to collaborate at all with people. I understood how efficient and important it is to collaborate. I changed myself to become a better person, to become more collaborative. Through interaction and organization, the focus of the class slowly began to shift from me to we, focusing on what I could do for the class to better the projects instead of just solely thinking about the grades and how to get a higher score. So here I'm trying to summarize some of the insights that we had, both from running uh, research studies and from teaching this. One is really, you have to really listen and care about the people. Every single person can tell you something, but only really if you listen, if you create a context where they feel fine actually telling you. And especially in the teaching context, if they care about you, about the course, then they really give you the feedback that is useful. And we observe most active and passive positive transformative experiences. So passive, you expose them to an experience, but the most, the deepest one of all when people really started stepping up, they took on the challenge we gave them or the challenge they uh, gave themselves. Designing for vastness in the classroom, sure, you can try to create these vast environments and virtuality, but there's also conceptual vastness, interesting concepts, something that really challenges them. For example, for the last epic, we asked them uh, to dissolve the teams and really work as one big hive mind, uh, which certainly represented conceptual vastness. Students also reported both a gradual change and really a pivotal shift. Personal growth was sometimes associated with a more gradual change, but often was preceded by a trigger or it prepared them for the next big step. So they really come together. And sometimes opportunities can happen or emerge that you really haven't planned for. So here the student was sitting down and had this relaxed and was like, you know, I want to see more energy. So we asked him to step up, see what's happened to him.
afterwards too, it's really shifted a little bit. There were just lots of these many moments. So sometimes you just have to basically act in the moment. So nothing you observe is, of course, how do you get out? How do you get people in and out of other reality experiences? It's really crucial. So we start creating safe spaces initially, so they felt more comfortable and gradually bringing them in, designing rituals and ceremonies uh, that you get there. Possibility to do things is a lot easier to do if you have an open and exploratory environment where people have some kind of ability to do things. Uh, we also ended up using more of a magical and fantastical environment. We try to use a playful, childlike environment sometimes so people more easily can suspect their disbelief. And as you can imagine,
So keep 